So we're going to be recording tonight's uh, presentation uh, and session as we've done with the others, which will be posted to the uh, advisory group uh, website on the EC Safe and Sound uh, website. Um, so I thank everybody for joining us. Um, I want to do a quick introduction of some guests tonight. So um, uh, let's run through our, our invited guests for this evening. Um, so uh, we have uh, from uh, Quinn Evans Architects, uh, Anat, do you want to introduce yourself briefly? Yeah, hi, this, my name is Anat Ranan. I'm with Quinn Evans. Um, we've been working on Main Street Ellicott City for a number of years now and a handful of, well, primarily focusing on Kaplan's. We've done a few different phases of projects to help mitigate the, the flood potential there, which I'm sure we'll talk about more. Yep. Good to see everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, Mark Holmes. Yeah, hey, Zach, and sorry that uh, my video is uh, not working, but um, anyways, uh, I'm Mark Holmes with RRMM Architects. Uh, we are um, Zach with the uh, six building uh, backside demolition of the six buildings and then also the demolition for the four buildings as well as with the six buildings the kind of the rear facade um uh, design of, of of the wall that goes back once the demolition occurs um also working with site resources with which is the landscape architect for uh, park kind of up the hill from that site so uh, good to be here good to see everyone thanks for being here um, we also have, uh, uh, Steve from Quinn Evans. Hi, I'm Steve Schwenk. I'm an architect at Quinn Evans, and I've been working with Anat and Zach on the, uh, Kaplan's building facade restoration. Good to see you. Thanks for joining Steve. And, uh, I think last but not least of our, uh, of our guest tonight, we have Patty, who you all met, um, last time, but I'll let Patty, uh, reintroduce herself again. Hi, good evening. My name is Patty Restrepo, as Zach mentioned. I'm with Charwell Enterprises. We work with the county regarding uh, real estate projects or real estate in general. So, and I was, yes, as Zach mentioned, I was on the call, uh, probably I think it was in end of July or August. So, to be Thanks back. Thanks for being again, Patty. I appreciate it. Um, so, uh, I know we had uh, put in the agenda for tonight that we would give a little bit of an update on the courthouse. Um, so, we'll start there. Um, we had hoped to spend a little bit more time tonight on the courthouse. Uh, last night was our application for the zoning map amendment uh, was heard before the county's zoning board. Uh, the uh, case started um, a little after six uh, and at 1030 it was continued to the next uh, date. So we can't really go through many of the specifics um, of that because it's still an ongoing case. Um, we were hoping that we would be able tonight um, to speak to you about the outcome of that case and the next steps of the project. Um, so with the courthouse, what we will be um, with the, the, the process, uh, you know, where, where we got to in the hearing last night was the technical staff report um, was introduced by the Department of Planning and Zoning. And then the Department of Planning and Zoning staff was cross-examined um, by those in opposition, as well as the members of the zoning board. Um, so that, that case, we're awaiting the date that it will be continued to. Um, the zoning board is reviewing their calendars and anticipates getting back to us. Um, in the very near future, and we'll be able to uh, continue our zooming, uh, continue continue that case. So, um, so, uh, so I apologize for not being able to give you uh, more of an update on the courthouse, but uh, it is what it is, and uh, we'll, we'll be continuing our case before the um, before the board. Hey, uh, I'm gonna try to to mute Mr. Ben because I'm getting a little background noise from him. Okay, okay. Let's keep moving on here. I'm so, so what we're going to focus on for this evening's uh, meeting is we'll we'll talk a little bit about um, what we've been doing with the number of buildings on Lower Main Street, and what I really hope to do is have a conversation about um, the, the the form shape of what these buildings are, and then how the county um, can look at using them, and how uh, what uses we can populate them with that will be. Uh, you know, conducive to county ownership. So I'll, I'm going to share a few slides that I put together um, to share before the County's Historic Preservation Commission recently. Uh, we're still in the process of working through an advisory comment application to them, um, but I'll share with you again a few slides um, from that presentation, and uh, and I'll speak to that 
um, a little bit here, and and I, um, uh, I'm not going to spend a heck of a lot of time running through this, but I'll give you guys a little bit of background because I know some of you aren't necessarily uh, familiar, intimately familiar with um, with these areas of Ellicott City as as we. Uh, so, uh, so what we've been working on is uh, six buildings here that are highlighted in orange. Um, these are between 8081 and 8125 Main Street. Uh, you know, the county purchased all of these buildings after the 2018 flood uh, from various property owners uh, with, at that time, the intention of fully removing the buildings for flood mitigation. Um, when the administration, uh, Ball administration came into office, uh, they reprioritized uh, taking another look at the Ellicott City uh, flood mitigation plans and established the EC Safe and Sound Plan. Uh, which uh, had a priority, uh, a pillar of historic preservation. And so we worked a plan to be able to keep a portion of these buildings while removing the portion of the buildings that's most susceptible to future flood damage uh, to increase uh, conveyance in the channel network and basically allow us to get the water to the point where it can drain um, to the left side of the screen or to the east. So the Ellicott City Watershed Master Plan includes three policies that specifically uh, work um, and address the area that I'm going to speak with you all a little bit tonight and that I hope to converse with everyone about. Um, we have um, uh, policy 8.5, which talks about the county-owned lower Main Street buildings. And so uh, what that includes is that we need to take a look at some big topic areas as we uh, prescribe what we're going to do with these buildings. One is provide high ground access. So one thing you'll hear us speak to tonight is the need to have both um, flood and fire egress, which um, generally don't don't um, compete with one another. It's just interesting that we have to think about potentially depositing building occupants at the building's highest level instead of at the lowest level, as we would do um, with a, a typical life safety or fire approach. That we want to have some sort of pedestrian bridge so we can get pedestrians from Main Street through the buildings and across to the other side or the higher ground on St. Paul Street. So we want to look to have an amenity space, spaces in these buildings that can be used for members by, uh, you know, by the public um, as amenities uh, that can be complementary and beneficial to Main Street. And then opportunities for interpretation. How do we interpret what was here? How do we um, preserve uh, historic elements, repurpose them, and tell a story of what was here and why it's not here anymore? Policy 8.6. Uh, is the access to St. Paul Street and that builds upon the idea of the pedestrian bridge and providing access from Lower Main Street through and across these buildings to St. Paul Street. And then policy 8.7 talks to St. Paul placemaking. And so it includes a potential development of a, what we are um, illustratively referring to as a St. Paul Pocket Park, a terraced park space that would again have some interpretation of what may have been there before, lighting and wayfinding too provide a connector between the rear portion of these buildings or to provide a connector, as I look at it, from Lower Main Street through and up to St. Paul's Church, which has never existed before, but would be um, something that, that could be a major amenity to not only the residents there, uh, but to uh, to other potential ancillary benefits um, in and around the church. Uh, these are three of the buildings that we'll be removing the rear portions of uh, the 8085, maybe at former Jordan's or Patelli Steakhouse, um, the 8095 building, which um, formerly housed uh, the Shoemaker uh, furniture business, and I'm not sure if John's on tonight, but uh, of course, John is intimately familiar with that building, and uh, I have two apartments above, and then the 8111, 8113, uh, former Johnson's um, buildings uh, that uh, most recently housed uh, part of Joan Eve uh, Antiques. Um, you know, these buildings have, have uh, been substantially changed over the years, most notably the 8095 uh, building, which was formerly known as the Rosenstock building, uh, completely destroyed by fire in 1999 and replaced with what we have today, which is quite a contemporary building, which allows us a unique opportunity to preserve a uh, second and third floor of it. And so, you know, I think we're all familiar with what the 2018 flood did. This is just an image of the side of the Kaplan's building, which we've since stabilized that was pulverized by water and everything that the water picked up during the 2018 flood. And so I think it, it speaks to a little bit about sort of what we're dealing with and why we need to remove a portion of these buildings. 
Um, this is today what the rear of the Kaplan's building looks like. We've stabilized, cleaned that up, um, and preserved uh, as much of the original structure as we could while removing the portion of the building that was above the stream channel. Um, so uh, looking first at the 8085, which was, the, again, the former Portales, um, we're going to remove a contemporary portion of the building that was constructed over the stream, the first and second floor uh, portions of the building, but maintain an original uh, portion of the building, which was built from terracotta construction. Uh, this is a rear review of the portion of the building that we'd be removing from St. Paul Street, which is quite overgrown. Um, and this the graphic here gives you a little bit of idea of, of the portion that we'll be keeping along Main Street while removing the portion over the stream channel. Removing that portion of the stream channel allows the water to increase in height and hopefully allows us to keep that water in the stream channel. Um, the, the, the interesting thing about this is there's an old grist mill race that's behind this building that's completely overgrown, uh, but still relatively intact, uh, the race itself. Um, and this, uh, at one point, uh, fed water that powered the grist mill, which is in the building at 8081 Tiber Alley, which formerly housed uh, the uh, rumor mill restaurant or before that side streets restaurant. And so this removal of the rear portion of this building really affords us an opportunity to preserve this mill race and expand upon uh, what its function was and, and, and uh, give that the opportunity to be viewed by others. Um, so I spoke a little bit about 8095 earlier the former Rosenstock building that was destroyed and replaced by 8095, the former Shoemaker building. And this building, it's a contemporary construction. It has a steel frame. It has these large concrete floor planks that span the stream channel. What we're able to do here is to remove the portion of the building over the first floor and maintain the upper floors intact. And I think this is really um, beneficial to Ellicott City because these are some of the larger floor plates that are available, most, most certainly on Lower Main, but, um, but also really throughout Ellicott City. Um, we don't have the benefit of these really large floor plates that can attract anchor tenants or can attract other uses that may require a large amount of space, um, which tend to, of course, um, be generators for other economic activity. And so uh, in this building, we really tried hard to evaluate how we can keep those structures maintain those big floor plates, even if they are on higher floors, because they do have such a value um, to the neighborhood. And this is the rear portion of that building, which is uh, relatively bland. And um, I'll show you some ideas about how we hope to improve that later. Again, the portion of the building to be removed here. I'll go back to that for a minute. The portion of the building to be removed. <clears throat> By keeping the, the other thing to note here is the second and third floor have pretty good floor heights, so we can put a use in there that's not going to feel cramped. It's going to be pretty good size space. It's wide open. Um, there's no bearing walls up there, so uh, it's a it's, uh, pretty unique opportunity. Uh, the um, building itself, like I mentioned, is relatively contemporary. And so when we looked at this um, through the process, you know, we, we uh, we, from the county side, DPW side, and, and our designers at RMM, we sort of taken the idea of like, hey, if we're going to try to take a contemporary approach to any of these buildings, this is the one to do it because there's nothing historic here. Um, and even though the form or shape of the building roughly resembles what was there, um, it's, it's all constructed of new materials and, and there's nothing that was salvaged or reused from the prior building. And uh, so the, the last two buildings that I'll speak to that we're going to remove a portion of are these uh, 8111, 8113, which set between the Shoemaker and Kaplan's buildings. Um, these are uh, what are viewed generally from the outside as, as two wood um, uh, row homes or townhomes that are connected to each other. Uh, they uh, both have parts of three stories. And uh, they, uh, the, they were completely reconstructed after the 2016 flood because they were exceptionally damaged um, to the point where the county administration at that time thought that they were had no choice but to demolish. Uh, however, they were preserved and reinforced and the front of the building held up relatively good in the 2018 flood, um, but the rear portion of the building, the uplift of water uh, uh, forced, uh, forced the reinforced concrete floor up and buckled it and it forced the floor up so high portions of the floor 
that it compressed the ductwork that was attached to the ceiling. So that gives you an idea about the turbulence of water that was in there. This is the rear portion of those buildings that we removed, including the sloped roof and the, um, the um, siding uh, that you see here, where you see the white siding on the left side of the screen, that's the line of the building that we would be. Another view of the and a graphic that shows uh, that portion to be uh, so the image in the bottom right shows you know portions of the floor that were buckled by the force of the water in the rear of the building um, and the image in the top right shows what it looked like after the immediately after the 2016 flood and so these these projects um what, what we'll talk specifically about tonight is kind of how do we reuse these buildings and how does that fit and i wanted to tell you all and, and, and let you all know how that fits within various projects that we have so we are going to progress an effort to sort of do the bulk of the removal of the rear portions of the building that I, I spoke to in the very near future. And um, we're waiting on just uh, a couple of um, minor regulatory approval documents to come in before we can release a purchase order and commence construction for that. Um, and then we'll, we'll move forward with developing rear facades for those buildings as quickly as possible so that we have sort of a complete building shell. We have funding in place to do both of those things. Um, we're looking at, at uh, continuing with a design of the St. Paul Park area um, through next year, and then looking uh, at a potential future funding source. Uh, we've applied for some state support for that project. And then what do we do with the building? So I'll speak to you tonight about the code and use study, and we hope to kind of progress this idea about what we do with the buildings by the end of the year so that we can work through how we renovate them in the early part of next year and then begin to implement those renovations in the latter part of next year with the hope of returning these buildings to some sort of use in the very near future. And so when we talk about usable space, what I, what I wanna uh, briefly hit on here was what the county has decided um, that, uh, they, that these buildings will be used for for the foreseeable future. So as prescribed by the master plan and as previously noted, this, um, these buildings will remain in the county domain, county control, until the completion of the EC safe and sound flood mitigation projects. And so that, that may be five years from now, uh, but we'll, we'll maintain ownership of these buildings and we'll be controlling the use, um, be that, uh, you know, what is in the buildings under county control until uh, at least the EC safe and sound plan is complete. The reason we're doing that so that if we get into a flood situation where we have to evacuate people that we can easily do so and that the buildings remain under the county's control i spoke a little bit about usable space and it's really important to think that and we've heard oh well are these buildings just going to be a facade is there going to be space that people can use inhibit you know, occupy and so we're we looking at a floor plate that might be 25 feet deep in some areas might be a little bit more in some areas but it's consistent with so many other sort of smaller scale buildings that are along Lower Main Street. And the graphic um, in the bottom uh, side of the screen here shows, you know, the idea that, hey, this, these buildings will be of similar scale and have similar sized spaces to so many other buildings along Lower Main Street. So we'll be completely in scale and character with what's there, which I think is really, really nice and really reinforces that streetscape as well. And so I'll, I'll briefly show you here a couple of things uh, that we're, we're contemplating for the rear facades. Um, I, we certainly welcome any discussion on this. Um, and I'm going to run through this, and then I'll go over to what we're looking at for the spaces that are available uh, in the buildings. And so we developed some ideas for rear facades, what we would do to, to put something back on the back portions of the buildings after we take them off. Um, and we have sort of two approaches. Um, so some precedent images that my uh, friends at RRMM put together uh, that they that they used uh, to to put these graphics together. But what we what we've been looking at with a sort of traditional approach is, you know, what what other materials are available or are present in Ellicott City? So you know, working right to left, the rear of eighty eighty one would not be substantially altered. The rear of eighty eighty five, the front is this larger scale terracotta. Could we put a larger scale brick on the back portion of 8085 
does that make it read and feel as a, as a cohesive masonry building? AD 95, do we introduce uh, do we introduce something like a horizontal siding, but perhaps in a little bit more contemporary scale? Um, that could either be a fiber cement board or another material that's present throughout Ellicott City. 81, 11, 13, um, do we simply clad the rear of those buildings um, as they are today with, uh, with a, um, a lap siding, uh, German lap or Dutch lap uh, that's present within the historic district? And at the Kaplan's building, do we look at you know, cladding the lower level there? With a board and batten or some other larger scale material to break up um, the strong horizontal lines of the brick from the vault. And the, the key thing here is that the, the side of 8095 is going to be very visible as we remove the rear portion of 8085 next to it to its east. And so the prescribed uh, uh, approach here uh, is very responsive to what was in the master plan, including a series of punched windows. Uh, similar scale to the front of the building. So pulling along some of that logic of these series of punched windows, having an exterior balcony to move along and experience the side of the stream channels. And a contemporary approach uh, as a second approach and might bring in some more ideas of new materials and, and playing um, and expanding upon, uh, you know, a, a new palette uh, with this approach that we're taking at this time that it's necessary uh, based on the, the, you know, the state that we're in today. Some images of what those materials could be, fiber cement or modern looking bricks, larger scale stone veneer. And so uh, this would be an approach that we would specifically look at for the sides of 8095. Again, as I mentioned before, this building was built in 2000. Uh, the sides have never been exposed. They've always been covered up by the adjacent building on either side. So this affords us really a generational opportunity to improve this building and make it a showpiece of the lower main street. It's going to be highly visible from the expanded DNO Plaza type or alley area to the east. Um, also visible from the pocket park that we'll be constructing behind the rear portion of St. Paul Street, as I mentioned. This affords us an opportunity to consider, as you see on the bottom, potentially a curtain wall element along the stream with a, a substantial amount of glass, bringing about transparency to the building, allowing one to experience the water courses of Ellicott City, which is favored and addressed by the Historic Preservation Commission guidelines from the building, being able to experience that um, from inside, which would be very unique. Um, or a, a um, approach that takes the idea of punched windows, uh, as you see on the top left, but maybe introduces a more contemporary scaling to that approach as well with a potentially a, 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 a adjoining material uh, that might uh, build upon the idea of horizontal lines, but do so with some of those other more contemporary materials that we mentioned. We also took the idea of, well, should we do anything to the front of the building? You know, does the, does the front of the building feel stuck in a particular time? Should it be, should it be evaluated, improved upon, and perhaps um, and become a showpiece um, that can can uh, can sort of tie the sides and the front cohesively together. And so we thought about: should we do anything to the um, the portico, the open porches on the second floor that are quite narrow and, um, although provide a unique opportunity to view Main Street, uh, don't necessarily provide that connection between Main Street and the interior due to the punched windows and the orientation. And so we thought, well, maybe we should take a look at expanding that, opening it up more, and really reinforcing that connection and views from the inside to the outside. And then lastly, a couple of things on St. Paul Street, and I know this is a lot to take in, but um, one of the things on St. Paul Street we wanted to look at was the idea of these um, carriage houses or small garages that used to be here. Uh, they were removed at some point prior to us acquiring the site. Um, but we have foundations left from them, which may provide us a unique opportunity. Um, those, these are those same foundations. This is looking at the site that we would explore for this uh, St. Paul connector park space. I'm um, looking up towards the historic St. Paul Church. This is again that same slope site, looking from the back of the 8111.13 up to the St. Paul Church, and looking at that site from St. Paul Street. And so we have a couple of ideas here. 
which are in the early stages. The first one being to look at a, we, we, we've kind of you know, looked at the idea of having a passive park space here. It doesn't really afford us a huge space that we can have some sort of active function. It's clearly not gonna um, be something that we want to, uh, to have you know, an event space or something like that because it is really wedged between these residential structures. So we've taken the idea of, of a passive park space and the need to facilitate egress from the 8095 building and provide safe passage up to St. Paul Street. And so one of the ideas is having a series of terraced overlooks with landscape um, low maintenance uh, slow plantings between. So you basically wander through this um, uh, serpentine ramp system uh, through natural plantings. Another idea we took a look at was, well, should we have more sort of a lawn space? Something that isn't really prevalent along St. Paul Street, you have a, a number of these lovely, uh, probably original mill worker homes, which are quite modest in nature and drop off significantly slope to the rear. Is there a way that we can incorporate an outdoor recreation space, a lawn space, something that might be an amenity to the adjacent property owners, as well as facilitating the need to have a flood egress and the high ground access? And so this looks at just a little bit different approach. Um, again, we're um, we're in the early stages here, and we'll continue to to develop that. But we welcome any comments you all may have. This is a pretty steep site, you know, so it's going to be a challenge to walk from one end to the other. You know, you're going to get your steps in, you're going to feel uh, feel the burn after. But we need to provide this connection to ensure that we have egress uh, from these rear buildings in the event that we need to have it. In the and you know, for this this pocket park, we have a. a quite a, a collection of, of, you know, really a lovely materials present throughout Ellicott City. But we might look at maybe some of those stones being um, used in a, a manner that um, maybe hasn't been um, developed yet in Ellicott City. So could we look at um, a more contemporary retaining wall pattern that sort of uses the same idea of, uh, of the other, um, you know, fully mortared stones we have? Uh, you know, the idea of having lighting that wouldn't be uh, blinding, but, you know, low natural landscape lighting that's providing enough light to maneuver through the space, uh, but not to blind the neighboring residences. So that's um, that there. Let me see if I can bring this. All righty. And so I'm going to run through this real quick, and then we'll kind of backtrack and go over it. So. What we did to look at we got these six buildings, like what the heck do we do with these six buildings? They're all small, they're connected with one another. And how do we use them, right? And so what we did is we did a code and use study here. And so what we did is like looked at the idea of how do we use these buildings from a building code perspective? I'll zoom in on the first floor of these because I think that's the, the easiest to make sense of. So we looked at three scenarios here for how we could potentially use the six buildings. So the six buildings right now were each individually their own built at one point, the two Johnson's buildings at 8111, 8113 were combined. And we took the approach of, should we, should we combine these buildings in a different manner? Should we look at all of the buildings being combined to one building? And the reason we looked at these various scenarios was the amount of stairs and elevators required to access the higher floors basically uses a significant portion of the usable area. And so what we wanted to do was to maximize usable square footage and look at ways that we could safely move through these buildings. So this first option here looks at three individual spaces, and this fits into how we consider using the buildings. Because as we look at how they're used, we have to understand that we'll need to move through these spaces collectively to egress. They'll need to be interconnected in ways that they haven't been before. They need to be individually served uh, with their own uh, toilets and HVAC and electrical systems. So let me explain the first one here. What we did for this first approach was we said, well, the 8081 building is, uh, is three stories. We didn't alter the floor plate in any way. Um, it's, it's basically two stories in an attic. We didn't alter the floor plate in any way. It's an original cut granite building. So let's just let it set as its own thing. And that was the first approach here. We said, okay, 8081 will be its own building. Now let's combine the 8095 and 85 buildings. 
And what that does is it affords us the ability to use the elevator that's in 8095 to get to the upper floors of 8085. And it allows us to remove an interior stair in 8085, uh, and, and, and that was in the center of the building, and, and maximize that available space. And then we combine the 8125 and 811113 buildings. Uh, that allows us to use uh, two existing stairs and add one new elevator that would circulate between those buildings. Uh, and so uh, that provides a, you know, um, uh, three, uh, again, this, this leaves us with three unique addresses, three unique spaces that can be each individually purposed, um, each with their own set of restrooms, as I mentioned before. One thing I wanted to note here is, we looked at this idea of rear egress. How do we cross the stream channel? And we connected uh, an element on the rear of 8085 and 95 in this option that also can pick up a second means of high egress from 8081. And that was important for us to be able to get out in the event of a flood and get to higher ground. That's what is kind of shown through this connector. The other thing at the third floor is we have a need in this scenario to add a second bridge type element over the stream at the rear of 8125. Since this is three buildings, we want to give each building its own ability to get out over the stream. So on the second floor of 8085, like I just showed you, where we can pick up 8081 as well, in this scenario, we need the second bridge. So we basically need two bridges crossing the stream. I'll, um, move over to the second option here. We said, well, is there a way that we can simplify this anymore? Is there a way that we can think about it maybe a little bit easier? Is there a way that we can provide uh, accessibility to the upper level of 8081, which we didn't have in the prior scheme? And so we said, well, okay, well, here's an option for two buildings. We can take the same idea from 8111, 13, and 8125, combine those, but now add the 8081 building and the 8085-95. And what that does is it means that we don't need that, that connector outside that we had here prior. We don't need a second rear egress outside to pick up 8081 because you can move from 8081 to 8085, from 8085 to 8095 and then get get across the street. What it does mean is at the Kaplan's building, we still do need some sort of rear bridge type element at the rear of the Kaplan's building. So one of the considerations here was, well, we don't need a rear connector over here. Maybe that affords us the opportunity to have some facade treatment that we would otherwise not consider. And so the, the ideas kind of play together and that's what I mean. move on to the last option. And so the last option that we put together was one big building. And so from a simplicity of code analysis, from a simplicity of execution, and a co-location of building services, this becomes uh, a clean um, and uh, usable solution. The issue that I worry about here, and I certainly welcome any advice from you all, is how do we how do we think about using these spaces for future county needs, right? For if 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 the county decides that in five to seven years, when we're done the EC Safe and Sound Plan, what to turn these buildings over so that they can seek their highest and best use? Does evaluating the buildings as one big building now preclude us from thinking about their highest and best use later on, because they potentially would always need to be interconnected to satisfy mechanical, electrical, life safety concerns, how do you egress through the spaces, that sort of thing. Now, some of the benefits, it only really requires us to have uh, one elevator. Um, it doesn't require us to have a second, uh, it doesn't require this um, balcony on the rear side uh, to the east, uh, but it, it may require us to have this, uh, in this case, what we can do is incorporate a balcony adjacent to the west side of 8095, and uh, and that removes sort of a bridge element from the rear of the Kaplan structure. So it might allow that Kaplan structure to be cleaner and simpler than its own. 
So I know I did a lot of talking there, probably more than I intended to. I'll stop sharing this now, but we can go back to that. So, you know, what I really want to do is throw out conversationally here and, and see, um, you know, kind of talk through some of the ideas of what some of you all think might be good uses for the county uh, to place in these six buildings and then talk about how those might fit into the way we looked at the buildings. Um, so I'll throw a few out there for discussion. Um, things we've heard uh, throughout um, the neighborhood, things that I've, I've heard as well um, uh, through, my, um, you know, through my conversations with some of you, uh, public restrooms, uh, a need for community meeting space, uh, the, uh, the idea that we could have, uh, of course, the high ground access that we mentioned, um, but other, um, uh, other spaces for pop-up businesses, for businesses that might be smaller and might only be interested in operating a stand on the weekends. Do we have some space that they can come in and use, uh, you know, for, for entrepreneurs or people trying to work their side hustle or something like that? Um, so those are some ideas I've heard. Um, through some of you, and I sort of want to welcome, welcome any other discussions that you all might have. Um, real quick, a housekeeping thing. Um, Orson, if you're um, still with us, if you could try to elevate uh, the, um, Roy, Rob, uh, Mary Catherine, and Mr. Pineda, uh, or or allow them to unmute themselves. And I think, I'm not sure who caller and call in user two is, but somebody's on the phone, so if we can allow them to unmute themselves. Um, that would be appreciated. Thank you. So we, uh, what do we think about what other ideas might be beneficial for, for us to consider here? Hey, hey Zach, can you just burp? <clears throat> um, just a general question. Can the county of like, lease space just like any other building owner i mean i'm assuming the answer is yes we can and uh and uh, we we currently do that at uh, the long reach village center which is owned by the county um patty might be able to speak a little bit more to how we do that but we uh, so it, it, like they could consider longer term uses but, i mean you could consider a mixture of shorter term uses like you said and someone who came and had long-term use, she could sign a multi-year lease with somebody, right? I mean, is there, Pardon. is there an administrative process that, um, she, you know, who makes the decision of who to lease to? Right. Right. Zach, if I can just jump in. It, what Please. the county does at Long Reach Village Center is that they, they do it just like any landlord would. They um, they market the space, or and they allow interested or potential tenants to come and tour the space. And then the county, of course, has a template lease um, that every potential tenant, or prospective tenant, reviews. Currently at Long Reach, what they're doing is three-year terms, and then um, it's the Bureau of um, Facilities is that is the one who oversees it in terms of the maintenance and whatnot. <clears throat> Excuse me, but they do have. Um, a property management firm that does collect the rents. And, and so they, they try to run it just as much as a landlord would. Okay. And then um, just the last part of my question <laughs> is if the county desired or, you know, if you wanted to make a lease in such a way to help somebody get started, you, you can structure that lease any way you want, right? In other words, it's like a really low first year and a intermediate second year. Like, to try to help someone start up. That, that's correct. I mean, the, the county has the flexibility, like any landlord, to determine how they they want to structure a lease. Um, you know, what we've seen is in, in at Long Reach, we do have a mix of which is good. We have a, we do have a mix of for profit and then also nonprofits. And so I, I have seen the county where they 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 like the business or the nonprofit and they understand the mission behind it and have been able to work, you know, with those tenants to structure, you know, a, a deal that makes, you know, sense for the county, of course, because there's maintenance costs and whatnot, but then also allows the business to get, you know, get established there and, you know, provide something for the community. So to answer the question, yes, they have the flexibility to um, structure a lease. Okay. So that, they see fit. That, I mean, there's a lot of options of what 
one could do and types of things you could put in here. It's not constrained to like government or government related uses. It's, it's anything you can imagine. Yeah, definitely not. I mean, we're basically constrained to the, the uses that are allowable as a matter of right based on the historic commercial zoning, um, which is generally the uses that you all see along Main Street. Um, okay. That would be, you know, stores, restaurants, uh, community, um, as I mentioned before, like little conference centers, office spaces, um, those type of things um, that, that we have present throughout the historic district uh, generally would be what we're allowed to place here. You know, just to, to speak to what Bert spoke to a moment ago, you know, one of the things that we as a landlord would need to balance in a scenario like that is we don't want to compete with the other landlords and we don't want to be uh, in a position where the county is, say, uh, in, a, in a scenario where they're uh, potentially undercutting other landlords or something like that, you know, and I know that's probably making it more blunt than it needs to be, but um, so it's, you know, it's something where it's a, it's a consideration of of how we use them and um, but but it you know, we we can structure as you mentioned Elise. one of the things that we will require if we do that is uh in the event of a flood watch uh that building would have to be vacated okay all right okay thanks thank you i have a question this is david ben yeah. um can there be housing in these uh, upper floors because the floor plates are perfect for smaller apartments, one bedroom apartments. And um, it would seem like uh, mixing some housing in there might be a nice thing as well. And if Howard County is even looking for um, a percentage of affordable housing, some part of that could be affordable housing too. So it seems like that's another option for the upper floors. Yeah, so um, Dave, I think that's, it, you know, I mean, most of the buildings previously had housing on the upper floors. Right. Right. Um, from a from a policy standpoint here, while we're in the EC Safe and Sound plan and county initial ownership, uh, the administration had made a decision that there would be no residential use, um, and that's mainly because we want to be able to control the occupancy of the buildings at any time, uh, due to the potential for need to egress through the spaces and potential for need to vacate in a flood emergency, and so we thought that it would be um, extremely difficult to restrict a residential use. Um, so, you know, when we look at improving these buildings for what we're going to be using them for for the next few years, uh, we need to do so in a manner that need not that doesn't necessarily preclude um, housing as their highest and best use long term. Right, because you're going to have second means out the back um, yeah. for even housing eventually, correct? Yep. Yep. Correct. Yep. So a mix in there, you know, we have this really nice historic Main Street, and so a mix of uses is, is seems like a really good thing, and which makes leads me to when you have those three building options, the one building, the two building, the three building, the one building seems the most alien to um, the real Ellicott City, to a, a real functioning Main Street with a bunch of uses along it and a mix of uses along it. And I actually don't understand how one elevator would work in there anyway, because the building floor plates don't all align. Yeah. So there would be stairs, if you even tried to connect them, that would not make them accessible, except for a couple of them, perhaps in the middle or something. So I'm not sure that the whole elevator issue with access is, is real in the option, in well, in many of the options, but certainly in the option where they're all one building tied together magically. Thanks. Yeah, we, we do have a, a section that runs through. We would need a series of lifts inside as well. And, um, it, you know, you're right. The one building does, does become um, uh, sort of the most challenging to uh, look at the various interconnecting egress, uh, both vertically and horizontally that we would need. Yeah, Zach, can I can I say, say something there? Yeah, that, you hit the nail on the head. This is Mark Holmes, the architect for the, for the new study. Uh, you hit the nail on the head. That was the challenge of this uh, of this effort was really matching up the floors uh, for the buildings. And so you, that's exactly right. But as Zach mentioned, to accomplish that, you would have a series of lifts uh, or or short ramps to make that happen. Um, that egress ramp in the back. Um, shown for the other, uh, like the two building and three building options, uh, that does that that helps in that regard. It helps kind of uh, 
meet floor plates as it as that uh, balcony were were to lace around the back of the of the building. So, good point there. So I'm also happy to go back to anything we showed if anyone wants me to, to pull anything up. I know I ran through that kind of quick because I wanted to give everybody a chance to weigh in here. So. I think it, not to dominate the conversation, but I really like the terracing and the, the pocket park going up to St. Paul Street as a solution and giving you second means of egress and turning it into an amenity. Um, and it really looked like a nice idea. I enjoyed the uh, the perspective that had it connecting at least two of the buildings up. And I hope it also still connects besides just going through the buildings down to Main Street in some way so that it's um, a usable way to connect up from Main Street up to the park as well. Yeah, and I think that that's certainly something that we need to think about as we work through and, you know, that feeds into how we look at the buildings as one, two or three. So if we connect it through and let's say we had a building that was focused on public needs, let's say we had a building that had um, a big uh, space that could be used for public restrooms, which again is one of these things I'm sure that some of my um, Main Street friends will focus on, uh, you know, having uh, mid block uh, of restroom space and having a space that um, uh, might serve a community group or organization. Can we have that done in a way that we can have free egress through that building, you know, during day hours and maybe we control it as we do the other public restrooms electronically at night so that you can, if you're a resident of St. Paul Street, uh, you know, one of the ideas I had was, is there a way that the church could potentially monetize their parking? On the weekends, you know, to raise money for the church and have a, a way for for shoppers who might be visiting Main Street to traverse down through the park right out the building right into the heart of Lower Main Street. Yeah, just building off of that for a second. Um, the the idea of like the that that intro perspective that Dave was talking about, uh, I think it was one of the first slides. There there was a real richness I thought to the space over the water especially on the i guess it's the west side um where everything is kind of in, inwardly focused towards the water and there's that park on the back that you know because of the the steep slope could have kind of a a, a terracing or almost like a bowl you know where um you know and then and then the the steel coming back over from kaplan's and the potential for a walkway back there so just thinking about it in terms of a a public side that would be a more exciting side to the building, maybe that that would that would drive uses like that that the public might enjoy more um, on the west side and the east side. I struggled a little bit more with, you know, what that could be, I guess. Um, but maybe that's a a more um, more private or or something that's that's like a destination that gets leased out, but it doesn't necessarily. You know, um, it doesn't have enough going on from an experience standpoint to really drive like a, a really interesting public use over there. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Steve. I think, um, you know, the. The, you know, the looking to the east and looking. From the B and O towards what we're about to create. Um, when we remove the 4 buildings on lower main street towards these buildings really. Is going to be a huge, tremendous opportunity for us, um, and and I I like the idea of sort of that, you know, kind of more of a experiential public side. I think that's a good thought. I do worry about the materials you were talking about on the back on the stream side when you talk about. Um, cement fiberboard and things like those, those are actually given the size of trees and boulders and things going down the stream. Um, fairly fragile, actually. Um, yeah, and, and I think that anything that's likely to get whacked with huge trees or boulders or things like that, we, we probably still need to think about masonry or, or concrete or something as much as I like the character of something a little bit more domestic there. Yeah, and I, I uh, perhaps didn't run through that as well as I, I should have, but, um, you know, I think that's a good point. Um, you know, we are trying to look at what height do we want to have 
um, and, and looking at the, the end term, what we anticipate would be, you know, the reasonable predictive modeling would show for the reasonable worst case, uh, you know, water level that we'll get in the future. Um, and, and certainly looking at a resilient approach to that level uh, is, you know, we, I don't want to, you know, I, uh, uh, you know, I live here too. I want to be a good steward of the county's money and I don't want to put something back that becomes a maintenance nightmare for eternity, right? So, because it's right. certainly not an right. easy, easy place to get back and, and clean up and maintain in the future. Right. But any of our, uh, any of our other Main Street friends or uh, Ellicott like City residents, what do you guys think? Uh, here's Amanda, I'll speak up. Um, so restrooms for sure, and I think Zach and I have already, you know, talked about that uh, before. Um, you know, we, we we're at the Welcome Center, and we have the you know the automated, uh, I guess, um, schedule for the the restrooms, and they are uh, very um, heavily used. And I know that's a challenge uh, for folks in town. Um, and the B and O, you know, they they have public restrooms that they do share, even if you're you're not a patron. Uh, but they have limited hours, so I think there's definitely a need uh, on the the lower end. Um, I, I, there was a market study several years ago, I think back in 2016, uh, that um, you know shows what the you know what the the market would support, um, what types of businesses that people would patronize um, and the thought was i know this was a you know there was an economic vitality um committee on um ecp um i don't know where that is currently but there was um the idea to you know see what those needs are what or you know see what the market would support and then what are we missing and kind of fill in from there you know in a in attract those those types of businesses and not you know and and does not have to be businesses, you know, and certainly, um, you know, there sounds like there's a lot of opportunity for, you know, cultural um, opportunities. Uh, art could be one of them, um, an art gallery um, or art programming. Um, just my two cents. Thanks. Yeah. Um, thanks for bringing up the market survey, Amanda. Um, I'm going to show you a slide here from, I should have uh, put this in the presentation I had earlier. Um, but uh, and what Amanda was mentioning was part of the Ellicott City Watershed Master Plan included a market analysis by Arnett Muldrow. Uh, and you know, I'm an architect, but I was fascinated by the data-driven market analysis. And it, 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 um, it noted some opportunities in key categories um, where um, Ellicott City was underserved by, including um, basically, they, they said Ellicott City experiences leakage, so people going elsewhere to satisfy uh, to satisfy what they would otherwise be able to find. That would include restaurants, home furnishing stores, jewelry stores, grocery stores, specialty food stores, and hotel accommodations. These were the key categories that they identified. Um, and so, uh, we um, you know, I don't we mentioned before that we aren't um, looking at a uh, residential use for these, but I wanted to share this. Um, since, since Amanda brought up. This is a slide that I have for a, a separate presentation on the courthouse, but brought those that data up. Uh, the um, you know, so I, I think sort of everything except hotel accommodation uh, becomes something that could could theoretically be considered here uh, from the county's perspective. Yeah, but that, um, I, I, I got it observation of something to think about sure um, if you're going to have public restrooms and things it kind of goes to a long time thing i've always you know on main street haven't been down here is you kind of have to make sure it's maintained like not once a day um like trash cans need like a mall does like the mall's got to empty the trash cans when they get full not every morning because they overflow and all if you're going to have restrooms, they got to be maintained and things like that. And we got to make sure we have an operating plan that addresses that and doesn't let stuff just like, sit every day. And once a day, somebody comes by, it's got to be closer to um, like active mall management or something like that. Is that in the card somewhere? Is it in 
I talked to Mark DeLuca about this a long time ago. He says, well, that's in the operating budget, Bert. And I said, yeah, it does, you're not going to spend all this money and then like not take care of it. That's not. I think certainly it becomes something where if the county is going to prescribe, uh, you know, a county owned uh, restroom in this area, then we, we definitely would have a county cost to maintain that that we have to plan for. But I mean, it's broader than the restroom. It's like it is classic down here. That the trash cans are overflowing every Sunday morning and no one picks up the trash and that's what it looks like when you come into Ellicott City and we're going to have this nice park and these nice buildings sure. and invest that kind of money it needs to be welcoming and clean sure. yeah I mean we do uh um yeah, I'll hit on a little bit you know we have a we have a custodial contractor who maintains the uh, the restrooms that are in the, the lower level of the welcome center uh, and so, you know, we we have the ability to contract with them and expand that um, as need be. And the other thing that we may need to look at, um, and and I'm not sure what the funding sources, but um, you know, uh, and uh, some of my other architectural friends or Patty may be able to speak to this, but there are um, there are private uh, developers who have uh, you know like site day borders who will go around and, and uh, you know, clean or maintain empty trash cans and stuff throughout a site. I mean, that's a, it's a very common thing um, for a, you know, something like a mall or, you know, as you were mentioning, a larger commercial landlord to have. So it might be something that might be, need to be looked at more closely as we are expanding these amenity spaces. Yeah, I think that's, that's important. Uh, being right across from Tiger Park, nobody takes care of it. <laughs> if we're going to make it a lot bigger, it needs to be well cared for. I think I, Tara has her hand up. I don't know if it's. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, please. Um, I know you are trying to do the arduous task mm -hmm. of planning for now, um, but I'm wondering is the CDC at all, right. all still a possibility when the county is finished seeing through the safe and sound plan? to be able to help with the, the next phase. And I realize I might be jumping way ahead here, but the CDC would seem to be able to maybe address some of the, some of the issues that we brought up tonight. So um, kind, of kind of where we are now, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we plan a use that we can, we can benefit the community now, complement the community now, but not preclude ourselves from a long-term, you know, highest and best use. I myself am not sure of the CDC. Um, I don't know, um, Brian. I don't know if you, Brian Schefter. I don't know if you know. If you have any any additional information? And um, if not, we can certainly follow up. Um, so Shana uh, was um, the staff advisor to that before, uh, and so she, uh, of course, she's on maternity leave, and she would. Be able to speak more uh, eloquently than than me to it. So, uh, but we yeah, I'm afraid I, I don't have anything to add. But uh, certainly would encourage us to revisit it when Shana is back. Yep. So we'll uh, we'll certainly make an action item to follow up with her, um, and uh, and try to at least explore that as uh, helping us inform what could be a long term use, long term approach. Thanks, Tara. Thank you. So I think uh, got some some good thoughts um, so far. Uh, the one of the other things that uh, had been thrown out by a couple of people was a, a space office space that might be able to be used by community groups. Just wanted to know from anybody who who might be involved with the community, do you do you feel like community groups still in today's environment need like a dedicated office space? Do you think that there's anybody if we were to say build like a, a shared conferencing uh, area, something I might have like a, a shared reception space with a couple of conference rooms, huddle room or like offices that could be reserved um, or, um, you know, that might be open to multiple groups uh, to use as meeting space, you know, kind of given where we are in today's 
post-pandemic slash future post-pandemic life, um, does does anyone feel that that's something that would be viable or desired um, for those of you who might be involved with community groups? Maybe uh, Chris uh, Pineda or um, you know, anybody anybody else who might be engaged with that? Um. Well, as president of Preservation Howard County, I think it would be great to have a space like that uh, just because we just resumed meeting in person and we go to each other's homes uh, to uh, around the board. So I could see that as being beneficial. I know Patapsco uh, is it Heritage Greenway is on um, uh, Tongue Row um, and, you know, we don't really need a space all the time, but we definitely do need space as we reestablish ourselves. So, yes. Yeah, I saw Aaron was on too. I don't know if Aaron has any thoughts. Thanks, Dave. I, I mean, I can hop in briefly, Zach. Just, I mean, you know, we, we the space has been useful for us. I mean, it was a small meeting space and um, certainly would make it available to others as well if they need it. Um, the question, I guess, is sort of how much, how much sort of office space is is essential in that, in that part. I, I don't, I don't have a sense of other organizations sort of, you know, who who has that need um but it's worked well for us cool. uh, hey zach is bird um yeah. I, I think it's probably useful to have that i mean i'm just thinking from my perspective there are there are times when we exceed our capability to have people in our building um you know to have like a sit down meeting um it'd be kind of nice as people start coming back out again in like 22 i'm hoping um yeah it, it, i can think from my perspective it'd be useful and i would think if you're you know a smaller business that doesn't necessarily have a building like like ours yeah that could be come in pretty handy i think it it could be really useful yeah i see um chris uh chris put a comment in the chat i I don't know if he's unable to mute himself, but um, you know he said uh, one, that he felt that space would be also beneficial to organizations like the Ellicott City Partnership. And one of his other comments here was uh, uh, he's not sure if any of the buildings would have a kitchen capability, um, but a kitchen incubator would be unique to me. Um, so um, I want that's a, it's a um, thanks for bringing that up, Chris. Um, the uh, you know, it's one of the things that had been brought up before um, that we hadn't talked about yet was having a, a, a food hall type space or a space where um, maybe smaller startup uh, may be able to have like a pop up food event and having the ability to have sort of the basic infrastructure for them to do that and come in and, you know, on the weekends or, or when we have a peak demand uh, to, to offset and, and provide additional uh, food offerings. Um, that otherwise wouldn't be able to be offered by our restaurants. Um, so, you know, welcome any any thoughts that we have on that. I wanted to jump in one more time and comment mm -hmm. on that kind of glassy um, part of, is it Shoemakers um, 8095 uh, that was going to be potentially proposed over the stream? because that could be quite a marvelous thing from the inside. If you get up to the second floor, all of a sudden you'd be in a space that looked out over the stream for, you know, and most of these buildings um, would never have that experience. Um, so if you talked about some kind of mixed use kind of communal space that even could be, you know, so mixed use that it could have community events, could have kitchen stuff rolled in, yeah, if it was this glassy, it's like a bridge, you know, and it would be a cool, very cool thing to have that space be a, really a special use where you have this unique Ellicott City thing where you actually look both ways along the stream. It could be very cool. I think it's a neat idea. I also like the, the approach on the front where you get at least the middle section, that whole middle section could be glassy going up and down sort of maybe it it leads directly up to that space um i don't actually like where the second floor horizontally comes glassy and then the third floor looks like it's you know pasted in space over the top of that 
but having the middle third vertically being glassy and then having this really glassy thing over the stream could be quite fun and 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 be a good way for people to experience the stream and then have some special space up there. So I think it's a neat one to be pursued. Thanks, Dave. Um, um, one of the, um, you know, I, I welcome any thoughts from from Tara or Mary Catherine or any of you who may be preservation minded um, individuals on what you think about um, incorporating a, a, an all glass or a primary, primarily glass facade um, on this building in relation to uh, some of the other historic buildings that we have within Ellicott City. Oh my gosh, I wish Rob Brennan was on. He was on earlier. He's in Preservation Howard County with me yeah. and he's an architect. And I think he could speak much better. Um, Mary but put a comment in the uh, chat that she said if, if done right, it could look great. So, yeah. I think if anything's done right, it could be great. So I would sure. agree. And we, I, uh, we, I will, uh, I'm happy to disseminate this later. And, you know, of, of course, as always, we welcome any, any comments that any of you have, uh, you know, feel free to email to me, uh, after this or, or to EC safe and sound at powercountymd.gov as well. As always. Uh, something I had put in the chat too, Zach was, uh, possibly art studio space for local artists. Yeah. Um, a uh, local artist had approached me about wanting something like that in Maine, but they couldn't find it. Uh, something where they could feature the, them actually doing the work, um, their art at on the windows. Um, and then another possible collaboration, even with like the library system, um, some small hybrid library model for family and kids, um, something that Anne Arundel County Public Libraries does very well um, in the shopping malls, um, but something that could add an, el an element for families and kids. Thanks, thanks for bringing that up, Chris. Um, you know, I, I know that is something that we've we've heard from members of the community before is to try to have more sort of family centric elements. So I think that's a good line of thought. If there's any other feedback on that. I'm certainly happy to touch base with the library and see what their thoughts are too. I for one like the idea of the performance art space, you know, or, or artist studios that you can experience. It's it's a cool idea. You know, like being able to interact with the makers. I think it kind of feeds off the eclectic nature and uh, the very interactive shop owners that we already have so uh, mary catherine put a comment that state uh art and entertainment districts require that so might be something to look at now um, they require affordable art of studio space so it might be something that if we create that might might help us be potentially available for their outside funding who knows cool. Um, circling back to the idea of uh, um, uh, like a communal food space, uh, any of other community members who want to weigh in, what do you think about the idea of having a space that uh, that can be used uh, to kind of, you know, sort of peak times to help, to help provide some additional food offerings, additional space where you know people can you know, get off their feet so um, so Mary Catherine thinks that it might be tough on the other food offerings in the chat here and then uh, Amanda mentioned that um, she says a food hall and artisan stalls are a great idea and popular in metro areas she's stuck on mute no, no, welcome any thoughts from anybody who hasn't spoken yet. Uh, Esra or Kathleen or Ali, Roy, you guys have any feelings? It's 
So I think it, uh, you know, if we go that way, then we, we, of course, have some involvement that we need to consider with the health department uh, to make sure that we, uh, we develop a space that can safely and, and properly be permitted and used for that um, as well. So something to consider. I'll throw out one of the crazy ideas that I had, and I, I think I mentioned to some of my uh, my architectural friends who are here, uh, duct and bowling alley. Yeah. I'm trying to think of like activity spaces. You know, I know we have the we have the uh, axe throwing um, uh, axe throwing virtual arcade space on top of wi um, wine bin. Um, so you know, I don't know if anybody has been there yet, um, besides myself, but. Pretty cool space, um, and I like the idea that it brings people down there for a group. You go X throwing, and then that group might do some retail shopping. They might visit another local watering hole or two and have dinner. And so I like the ideas of having, um, you know, having um, spaces that uh, that that might be you know driving people, and then those people spilling over to other interesting uses. Mary Catherine had a question of any plans for performance space. So when we did look at the code and use study, we did identify that uh, the larger plates of 8095 on the upper floors um, could, could potentially accommodate an assembly function uh, based on our code analysis. Um, so um, they do have a uh, higher floor to floor height on the second floor there. And so if we were gonna look at a performance space, that might be a, a good opportunity for it, um, I guess. I would welcome any feedback from from the community of you know what whether they they see a need for something like that. I know um, there uh, I don't think there really is a, a sort of community performance space in the Ellicott City Historic District now um, that I know of specifically. Um, you know, of course, the Patapsco Female Institute and its outdoor space uh, is used uh, extensively for like Shakespeare performances. So. Well, uh, throw it around for any last words here, and um, I think thank everybody who's participated, provided comments, and if anyone has thoughts that they have that they uh, didn't want to share in the group here, and want to email me or or give me a call or text to, to chat about, it, I'm happy to do that after this. So I'll throw it around for any last words. If anyone has any thoughts? I'll throw out an idea. You know, the east wall of um, shoemakers, right? That's going to span across at the upper levels. Um, that's going to be visible from the, you know, park that's going to be created down at the bottom. You know, after the, the three, the four buildings are removed down there, and there's a park. Um, I wonder if you could project something on there, and you know, sort of speaking of performance, you, know, you could actually sit in the park and sort of look up there. I, I realize the angle isn't a straight on shot, but but if not projection, then you know maybe a chance for some visual art on that wall or graphics or signage or something like that. It'd be kind of fun. Yeah, I think it's a neat idea. And uh, we have a outdoor movie space at the wine bin now that is quite popular. Um, but I kind of like the idea of of having some, you know, some sort of something that maybe be able to be experienced from that larger improved park space. Or perhaps from the St. Paul uh, Pocket Park, if you imagine terracing down, you could sort of see that as kind of layered seating and you could have projections or something onto the backs of those buildings there that we were looking at earlier. Yeah, yeah you know what? kind of cool. You could project challenges. a haunted house at this time of year, you know? <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, I mean, what Ellicott City is one of the most haunted areas in in the country. So, uh, so who knows, right? Maybe there would be no need to project it. We can just have our own. <laughs> just invite the ghosts. The ghost tours are quite popular, you know. I'm not. I mean, sure, some of you all have been on uh, been on the ghost tours, uh, but I uh, I highly recommend it if you haven't done it. If you uh, if you call Ed and uh, mention my name, he'll charge you double. Cool. 
Great. Uh, well, I really appreciate everybody joining us tonight and, and taking the time out to participate. Again, I welcome any other comments, thoughts that you all might have. Um, to recap our next steps in this process. Now, we, uh, we received uh, the okay from our HPC uh, last week to remove the rear portions of the buildings. Um, and then the, the, the diagrams that I showed you all tonight uh, is sort of a preview of what we will show them on November 4th um, for their advisory comments. And then that will inform how we improve those rear facades um, the, uh, as we progress through the, the design of those. What we'll be um, working through uh, later, uh, you know, later on in the process, as I mentioned, is sort of how we begin to use these interior spaces. But I think we've gotten some good ideas tonight and, and continue to progress progress that as well. The um, uh, so timing wise, uh, my hope is that uh, we're we're going to be able to start removing the rear sections of the buildings uh, very late this year or very early next year, um, which I know will be a welcome. A welcome thing to, to to be able to progress these uh, these buildings towards reoccupancy and support uh, our our community on Lower Main Street, um, and I'm excited to to get that going and move that forward. And um, I, I thank everybody for really, uh, especially all of our consultants who normally aren't with us. I thank you all for taking the time out of your evening uh, tonight to to join us and, and comment. And and as always, our members of the community, thank you all so much for the input and, and time. And uh, thanks, thanks to Orson from our DTCS group for joining us and uh, operating the WebEx for I appreciate that as well. Thank you. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you as well. Thank you. Thanks, Zach. Thank uh -huh. you.